Under this fractional reserve scheme, we inevitably become debt slaves to a ruling class of financial elite, not because they are better or smarter than anyone else, but because they have rigged the system to benefit themselves at the expense of most people on the planet. Catherine Austin Fitz is an expert on this issue. She was an assistant secretary of housing and urban development under President George Bush Sr., and then an advisor to the Clinton administration. Let's set up a game of Monopoly and you want to buy Park Place. Um, what I can continually do is just print money, give myself more money, lower the value of your money by printing more. No matter how hardworking you are or how successful you are, I can always end up buying you for free. So how come if you or I make up money it's called counterfeiting, but if the banks do it, it's increasing the money supply? How did the banks get this power? This is Jekyll Island, where in 1910, representatives from the Rockefellers, Rothschilds, Morgans, and other private bankers gathered, secretly, to draft the legislation that would create the Federal Reserve. Ed Griffin literally wrote the book on what happened at Jekyll Island. Central banks are banking cartels which have gone into partnership with the respective governments in the countries where they operate. And they've been given monopolistic power over the creation of the nation's money supply. That's what the politicians handed to them as a gift, you might say, for the partnership. Now, in return, what did the bankers do for the politicians? They promised to create money out of nothing, now that they've got this legal power to do it, any time the government needs it. And since 2008, we've witnessed the greatest fake money printing run in recorded history. This financial sleight of hand disguises the costs, hides who's to blame, and leaves us as debt slaves working to pay off the bill. I found it revealing that in the same year the Federal Reserve was founded, 1913, the Internal Revenue Service was also established. An income tax was then instigated so you and I would have to pay the politicians' debt plus interest to the bankers. The problem is we have a privately owned central bank system uh, in the United States disguised as a government-owned system. Now, if you look in the, the uh, uh, telephone book here in the Washington, D.C. area, um, you look up for Federal Reserve in the blue government pages, it's not there. It's in the white pages right next to Federal Express. It's a privately owned central bank. What is the uh, proper relationship, what should be the proper relationship between a chairman of the Fed and a president of the United States? Well, first of all, the Federal Reserve is an independent agency, and that means basically that uh, there is no ag other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. There is no other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. We have a private bank that prints money on behalf of the Treasury. The Federal Reserve prints money on a debt-based system which creates scarcity. But it puts a group of insiders in a position of having access to all the data about the economy when we don't. So you have a, a small group of bankers who understand the data on how the money works in the economy and it gives them the ability to print money in a way that the insiders are protected and everybody else is drained. Catherine went on to compare a healthy economy to a vibrant Taurus, balanced, freely flowing, and energized throughout, in contrast to what's happening in our current economy. What, what you have is, uh, is a system that's very dynamic and it's trying to optimize, um, but but intertwined in the core of it, you have a tapeworm. The way a tapeworm works in your body is it injects a chemical into your body that makes you crave what's good for the tapeworm and bad for you. You have a parasite that's, that's very much manipulating and engorging itself at, at the expense of the whole. We live in a tapeworm economy where the financial elite are the tapeworm and they're feeding on us. 
and they don't like it when people blow their cover. After Catherine began exposing government corruption at the highest levels, the FBI raided her company and seized its assets. She was dragged through the courts for 10 years before being found innocent. So we've got the Federal Reserve, a privately owned corporation with a monopoly on creating money, but with no accountability, backed up by a government with a monopoly on force. The country got sold on the Fed as an institution that would help stabilize the economy and remain independent of politics. But in fact, in close to a century of existence, the Federal Reserve has done just the opposite. Since they took charge, we've been robbed through inflation, and the purchasing power of the dollar has declined more than 96%. And the wealth gap makes it clear most of the money is going to a very few. Only 16 years after the Federal Reserve was in power, America experienced the Great Depression. My research revealed that before the big crash in 1929, the elite bankers pulled their money out of the stock market. After the crash, they used that money to buy up cheap stocks and smaller failing banks for pennies on the dollar. Among the bankers who consolidated their wealth this way were the Rothschilds, Rockefellers, and Morgans. A similar scenario played out in the 2008 financial collapse, with the same bankers benefiting. In the years leading up to the collapse, the biggest banks, including Bank of America, Citigroup, and Chase, controlled by the Rothschilds, Rockefellers, and Morgans, were bundling and trading bad loans that they knew would eventually fail. It's like putting rotten oranges in a box and selling them as grade AAA. The bundlers of the debt knew it was only a matter of time before someone would open that box and see that the content was worthless, since they were the ones who packed the boxes in the first place. When the rotten oranges, what we hear about as unsound loans, derivatives, and credit default swaps were finally discovered, everyone was impacted. People lost their homes, their jobs, their businesses, and their retirements. Meanwhile, the biggest banks who created the problem in the first place were the ones who got bailed out. Why is that? Why would the Federal Reserve give trillions to the banks, even though the majority of Americans were against bailing them out? And why not help those most in need rather than the perpetrators of the financial collapse? My research led me to believe that the same people who created the Federal Reserve, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, and the Morgans, still control it, and they use this scheme to bail themselves out at our expense. Many of the banks created are still the most powerful lobby on Capitol Hill, uh, and they, frankly, own the place. I'm convinced that the near collapse of the economy in 2008 resulted from an orchestrated pump and dump scheme designed and executed by the big bankers to consolidate wealth and power. David Icke explains how he sees the Federal Reserve rigging the so-called business cycles. Stage one, it's like throwing a fishing line out. Stage one, you put lots of money, units of exchange, into circulation. You do this by pushing interest rates down, by making lots of loans. This is the part of the cycle we call a boom. Because there's lots of units of exchange in circulation, there's lots of money changing hands. That generates lots of economic activity. That generates jobs. And as more and more money is spent, there's more demand, so companies take out more loans of fresh air money to increase their production. People get confident in their everyday lives. Hey, you know, I work for this company, they've got lots of orders, ah, it's really going great, my job's safe, I tell you what, we can have a bigger house. Then they start to change it. What they do is they pull the fishing line in. They push interest rates up. Now fewer people, um, A, um, are taking out loans, and they make the criteria for having a loan from the bank stronger anyway. 
And also, now, as interest rates have gone up, a larger part of people's income is going to pay back the extra interest and not being circulated in buying things. Suddenly, there's nothing like as much money in circulation, and therefore, fewer things are being bought. Companies start to go down in terms of their profits. They start to shed jobs, and they start to go out of business. People lose their jobs, they can't pay the mortgage anymore of the big house they took out in the good times. Now what the banks are doing is starting to reel the fishing line in because as they go bankrupt, companies and individuals, the banks get the real wealth, the property, the land, the resources that they had signed to them for lending merely figures on a screen. Now this economic cycle of fishing line out, fishing line back, lots of units in circulation pull them in, has been going on for centuries. And what it's done, it's stolen and accumulated the real wealth of the world in the hands of the few. At the international level, central bankers use the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund to make more money while exploiting the resources of countries they lend to, bankrupting them in the process. The Central Bank of Central Banks is the Rothschild-created Bank for International Settlements. The elite are positioning themselves to control access to virtually everything we need to survive. No matter where you go in the world, the money is controlled by the banking system. They decide if people eat or if they don't eat. Who's a billionaire and who lives on less than a dollar a day? He who controls the money controls the world, and a very few control the money. At this point, my view of the world had been turned upside down. I was struggling with the realization that the failure and suffering of so many is actually success and fulfillment for a few. The elite central bankers who fooled the world into letting them create money. They already have vast fortunes, so what is their endgame? What is their ultimate agenda? <laughs> 